My name is Mark Powell, a label manager for uh, Esoteric Antenna, Cherry Red label. And uh, in March, Esoteric Antenna releases Jack Bruce's uh, album, Silver Rails. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, with us on Cherry Red TV is Jack Bruce. Jack, well, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to have a chat about the album and uh, everything. My pleasure, thanks. The, the album is the, is the first one that you've done for uh, 10 years. And uh, the first thing that struck me when I listened to it, first of all, first of all was, was how incredibly fresh the album actually sounds. Uh, yeah, well, I had this idea of... Uh, when, when you uh, actually asked me to do the record, the first idea I had was to try and sort of recreate the feeling of my first solo album, which is in 1969, and try and do a, a kind of modern take on that sort of... And it has that a similar feeling to that album. That's what I was going for, this kind of... Uh, it's almost like I'm setting out on a new journey, you know, which is what I was doing and what I'm still doing. <laughs> I mean, stylistically, as you say, I mean, there's an awful lot of different styles there on that album. Well, yeah, but it's all kind of my style, you know. <laughs> Uh, I make no, I can't really make records any other. There's always a bit of diversity on them, you know. So, so when you sat down to write this material for Silver Rails, I mean, did it all come together very quickly, or was it something? Uh, yeah, happened? mostly. It, it just everything seemed to happen uh, very like by chance, but it seemed to be, you know, be, you start thinking, oh, it's it, it, it's meant to be this way, you know. So all the songs, yeah. The first one I wrote was uh, Drone, which I actually wrote in the Canary Islands while thinking about how cold it was in England, because it was, <laughs> it was that spring, it would never actually become spring, remember last year? So that, that those were just were uh, sort of completely formed on one, you know, just, uh, when I wrote those, I was, uh, that was the direction of the album as well, musically, I felt. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Drone, because Drone is the track that really, uh, to me, stood out when I first heard the album, because it's, uh, it's your voice, bass guitar and drums. And yeah. the subject content there, obviously, was, was, it, was that inspired by the, sort of Af Af the American use of drones in Afghanistan? No, no, or? yeah, I mean, it's, it's just all kind of terror bombs and stuff like that. But uh, Really, this is a, a again. It's a, a take on politician. It's like another version of that. Really, like New Orleans feel, slagging off Maggie Thatcher. What more can you want for? Her? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. It does. It does have. You know, it seems it's Second World War as well, though, because it's uh, we overdubbed a Stuka, <laughs> which was uh, quite difficult, but we managed to do it, <laughs> and it's. Uh, it was an actual uh, raid that was recorded. It's an exceptionally really powerful war. track and very, very yeah. effective, I think. Yes, I, I wanted to see if I could do something with just bass and drums and make it, make it sound good. So in terms of um, when you actually were deciding you know, who, who to play on the album, how did, how did you come to that, that those decisions? Um, well, it's, it all, again, was very serendipitous. You know, it just all kind of seemed to fall into place. Because I just was going to go in uh, with the guys from my uh, touring band, and uh, and then gradually, uh, people I just found out that people were uh, around, you know, and invited them to play. As simple as that. And then each person was completely right for the track that they played on, uh, which was quite an amazing coincidence. You've got quite a, a stellar cast of musicians on the, on the album. You have yeah, some of, great guitar players yeah. uh, who shall uh, be named, I guess. Yes, you can uh, name well, them. Phil. I was thinking Phil Manzanera is, is yeah. Is Phil on. Phil plays great uh, on the first track. Yeah, and uh, Robin Robin Trower. Yeah. Well, as soon as I wrote that riff of Rusty Lady, uh, I just thought of Robin. I just thought, well, that's that's his kind of cup of tea. Talking of Rusty Lady, the thing that uh, came to mind when I first heard that was it, it seemed to be a throwback to, to sort of politician, what you yeah. know, like a, a step beyond that, obviously. That's talking right. About, yeah. uh, Mrs. T in that uh, thing. And I, 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 I think it might be. Yeah. Yes, I was. I'm I was, not really uh, sure. 
<laughs> I'll have to ask Pete about that. But I've got a feeling it just yes, might be. Yeah, right. the, the lyrics did make me laugh. I thought it was a very, very yeah, good Yeah, it's, it's me meant to be quite light-hearted, uh, <laughs> you know, treasonal, treason, treason. But um, the, the other thing about a lot of the songs on the album, there's a lot of very reflective material. I'm thinking in particular of a track like um, Industrial Child. Yes. Um, uh, what to say about that one? That's it's our uh, love song to Glasgow. <laughs> You've got to have one in yes. every album. So that's that one. And you you also have uh, Reach for the Night, which is another another song, which to me. Um, yes, uh, it's, it's quite an epic song, that one. Um, really, that was <laughs> simply that Pete uh, got in touch with me, told me he'd written these lyrics on a plane, on a flight somewhere, from somewhere, and uh, he emailed them to me, and I just immediately wrote the music. It was very quick. I mean, for, for me, Reach for the Night is, is, is I, I would say, it's a sort of future classic, really, I think. Well, it would be nice to think so, yeah. I, th I think it, I think it really is. It was it was a really sort of effective piece of music. And Thank you. Yeah. I think it was it was so nice to hear you play the piano on this album. Yeah, well, that was one of the great things about recording at Abbey Road. They've got all these different great pianos, all, all perfectly looked after, you know. So I could choose which piano for which track. <laughs> what about that? For luxury and being spoilt. It's fantastic. You know? How did you actually come to, to record at Abbey Road? How, how was that? How uh, was well, it was just by chance again, really. Uh, Rob Cass, who's my producer, and quite a brilliant producer, I may say. Um, I just met him at my daughter's film premiere and because uh, she had worked with him. Uh, and I just happened to mention that I was making an album. And he said, oh, come and make it at, at, at Abbey Road. And... Uh, so I did. <laughs> As you say, he's done a, done a, done a great job. Yeah, he's a, he's a great producer. Was it difficult for you to hand over the reins to someone else in, in terms of production? Because you've done so many albums on your own, you've produced your own things as well. Um, do you find it difficult to sort of let go? Of no, no, I, I like that. And anyway, I, I would be going in every day and we'd work together as well on the mixes. You know, if there were... Um, Things that I didn't like, there was no question of it, they just got changed, it wasn't like, you know, I had to defer to him or anything. He's a completely uh, soulful guy who just knows what's what's right, you know. As you say, uh, he's, I think he certainly brought out a, a sort of a modern side to your music and... Yeah, uh, I think so. Well, well, it's recorded in a very modern fashion, of course, but then people forget we always used the latest cutting edge technology, even when it was eight track or four track. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's just what we're doing. Yeah. It's, you, although it was harder to get a Stuka. At the time. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't bring a Stuka into the studio. No, yeah, then, you couldn't really no. do that. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Diving uh, for coffee. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was I was going to mention the track "Fields of Forever," which to me it's it's funny you should you mentioned the parallels with songs songs for a tailor but again that brought back memories of yeah it's, al it's, it's almost too. like uh it's reminiscent of that one i did with cream as well uh uh piano one on the the last cream album yes yeah yeah uh scrap your thing, thing yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> But it's, it's an incredibly catchy track. I would say even almost a, a touch of the I Feel Free in there somewhere as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my attempt. To, uh, no, I think it's quite successful, you know, trying to... But that one, again, I just knew we needed a track like that. And I wrote the music for that 10 minutes, that's it. <laughs> and then just uh, Pete came down and we wrote a l bunch of lyrics, you know, for anything. You know. Is this the first time you've written with? Is this the first time you've written with Pete for some time on, on this? this uh, yeah, it's been been quite a while, you know. But I have to talk about uh, Margaret's uh, lyrics on yes. the first one uh, on uh, Candlelight. I think they're quite beautiful, and uh, she she just uh, she was working on these uh, words, and again I just set them to music. So. I was going to ask you about exactly. Candlelight as a track because that is that is a very unique sounding track to me. Yeah, well. yeah, it is. And with Phil's guitar, uh, he's, he's taken it up another another level. Really, I think it's great what he's done. 
It's, it's a, an interesting way to start the album as well, because I think, um, I suppose as with most of your solo albums, uh, no one quite knows what they're going to get. <laughs> when, when they, when you, yeah, when it's, the, it's the, quite the, a surprising the track. The first track really main, is, is no indication of where you're going with it, but, no. but I think all, it, it's all for the better, I think. Yeah. You know, the, the freshness of, of a record that constantly changes is, 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 is great. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, a lot of the songs are actually musically related. I use bits of each song, you know, uh, in other songs, just to save, you know, yeah. save bits for later. <laughs> I think I think it flows incredibly well, and, and you have... Yeah. Um, My favourite is Hidden Cities, which, yes. I, which I, I'm very proud of, actually. And how, can you explain the sort of creation of Hidden Cities, or what it's about? Well, that was, uh, I just had this piece of music, uh, which I've been working on for, for some time, just trying to make something out of it, and then it fell into place really, because uh, it's a very exact uh, form. And uh, just sort of uh, then Kip Hanrahan wrote the words, and my old friend Kip from New York, and uh, that was it. Then just sort of recorded it. Really. And uh, Don't Look Now, it, mm. again, another very interesting track vocally I think yeah. uh, on that this yeah some interesting I mean, I, going the through. only thing I can say about that one is I sing the lowest note I've ever recorded <laughs> <laughs> but there are used statistic kinds out there and I believe you also recorded your voice on a, on a Mellotron as well on the uh, soundtracks uh, as well no um, no I didn't I just used the Mellotron no yeah. oh right I have my voice recorded oh on I the see Mellotron. right from 1974. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. Okay. And and you use that on. Oh on yeah, the, yeah. On the I had to use it once. <laughs> <laughs> what what made you revisit um, "Keep It Down" and "No Surrender" as well on the record? That's interesting. I don't really know why. And uh, I think the "No Surrender" track, uh, the singer from, uh, oh, it's, it's, somebody said they really loved that song and I hadn't been heard enough. And I just thought I'll uh, have another go at that. Because that's a really cracking version, I think. On, on yeah, it's the great. Album. And uh, again, Cindy Blackman and the drums there, amazing. She just came in not having heard that and just played that off. The same as Hidden Cities, amazing. So, uh, how much, so when you actually gather the musicians together in the studio, there wasn't really much time for they, they hadn't really heard the tracks at all? Or, or uh, they hadn't actually. I'd, I'd had demos. Um, I'm tr I think I sent the demos to, to a few guys like Frankie Tonto, the drummer, who played uh, in a lot of the tracks. And uh, yeah, he had to have an idea of it, really. But no, I just spring things on them, really. <laughs> They're used to it. <laughs> so the creation of... How, how does it feel now to be doing having a new album out? And um, are you excited by the, by the new material? Are you looking forward to playing it live? Oh, yeah, I think it'll sound great with my band, you know. Uh, yeah, I think it'll sound lovely. After such a long career as well, is it difficult to feel, still feel excited about music or is it still, uh, is, is it something that still excites you? When oh, you yeah, I mean, the, the music is a thing that, that's, that keeps you going. It's the, the bits in between if you're touring or something. That's not, I don't think it's anybody's favourite. <laughs> Maybe somebody. And not me, <laughs> but the, the the musical part of it is what it's all about, and to have a chance to do that record, wow, feel very very lucky. So, what what plans have you uh, touring wise? You're doing some UK dates. Yeah, I'm playing uh, all over uh, England and a little bit of Scotland, called Aberdeen, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm playing yeah, I'm playing that in March here. Yeah. Does actually playing live does it does it ever does it ever sort of get tiresome for you or do you still enjoy playing on stage? No, I love playing on stage. It's the, like a lot of people. It's the only time you feel alive, uh, and uh, you feel you feel kind of validated. You, I'm a proper human being here, um, so yeah, it's good. It's really good. The, I mean, the only problems for me are sometimes physical ones. I get touches of cramp and things nowadays. So then I just have to, I just do a little dance or something. <laughs> <laughs> Trip over the monitors. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in, in a career that has, that goes back to 
I, I, I you don't, yes. basically. <laughs> well, can I take, take you back to your, your, your formative years in, in Glasgow? Yeah. I mean, has, would you say that that, that that experience of growing up in Glasgow has, has, has formed the music that you've created? Well, I think Glasgow, uh, yeah, does have a, an influence on people who, who grew up there. I don't know what it is, <laughs> um, but it certainly stays with you. It's not something you shake off even when you leave. So I don't know what the influence is, but there's some, definitely something there. No because doubt about it. Even even on this record, as you say, it was it was a sort of a thing that I picked up immediately um, yeah. when I listened to the album. There seemed to that that same sort of reflectiveness that there was on albums like Home But I think Life. even musically it's quite, there's some bits that are quite Scottish, like uh, Don't Look Now, the piano part mm. of that. I think that's, it sounds, sounds pretty, I don't know about Glasgow, but somewhere in Scotland. And the Balmoral biscuit tin, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the cocky leaky yes. soup. <laughs> Going back to, to uh, Glasgow when you discovered music. I mean, how did music first come into your life? Was it? Oh, it was always music. My mother was always singing. My father played the piano, and uh, so there was always music in the house. And I listened. I had a lot of the great jazz guys when I was a bit older, jazz musicians who came through Ella Fitzgerald and uh, oh, just uh, Sonny Stitt, a lot of those sort of people. Uh, Duke Ellington, I saw him. So yeah, it was, it was a very musical uh, upbringing. Uh, plus, I was uh, then uh, did music A level and so on, higher as, as we call them. So you actually you actually went to the uh, <coughs> the World Academy, didn't yeah, you? Briefly, yeah, briefly. Yes. Um, I don't know. I think I'd kind of lost interest in that direction, and I wanted to uh, meet girls <laughs> <laughs> and hit the road. <laughs> I had enough of sitting around, sort of, you know, writing little Bach fugettas and stuff. Nice as they are. So when you when you took the road south, I mean, how old were you when you actually when you actually? Ah, uh, about seventeen, I think, when I first went. Yeah, I think when I ended up in London uh, properly, I was nineteen. Did you have any sort of firm? Uh, Offers of, of work when you actually when you actually went down to London. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I went I went to work in Italy in the Air Force bases. Uh, that was my first, almost my first uh, paid work. I I also did a summer season in in Danun. Didn't the water? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was quite an experience in itself. <laughs> that was that's right on the. Uh, the Holy Loch where the Pol uh, Polaris missiles are, so there's a lot of uh, trouble with that going on at the right. same time. It's an amazing time. And then you, you find, found your way to London and... and I found my way to Italy. Oh, Italy, first, yes. And then yeah. from there it went to London, yeah. And from there you... Uh, was Alexis Corner was, I think, the first? Uh, yeah, the first, the first proper band, yeah. Was... The London scene at that point, would you say that it was um, what that a lot? A lot has been written about all, all, all that uh, the, the the birth of the sort of London rhythm and blues scene and everything else like that. Mm -hmm. Was it was it a very broad broad based scene at that point, or, or was it? Uh, I think it was quite narrow. It was kind of broken up into two or three kind of enclaves of music, you know. Um, but I was uh, very much involved in in playing jazz. So I, I would be off playing all the time. I didn't really know much more what, what was going on. And I, then I, play, I also played with Alexis at the same time. And that was uh, very uh, formative. Very. So would you say that you started off, uh, you, were, you were firmly rooted in jazz more than the blues? I jazz? thought I was, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, to me, the first time that I was asked to go uh, to uh, audition for uh, Alexis's band, I went down the Hundred Club and heard the band, and I thought, "Oh no, this is rock and roll." <laughs> <laughs> Such a terrible musical <laughs> snob. Um, and then eventually, when I ended up playing with that band, just uh, I just was completely blown away by it, and and started getting into the blues. And that sort of that 
formative sort of that crossover, unique crossover of um, blues with some jazz elements. He then carried on with with the Graham Bond organisation. Yes. Yeah, more or less. But then, but I also. Cyril Davis was in Alexis's band, and uh, he's so inspirational as well. So yeah, I got completely got into this. Well, they called it rhythm and blues in those days. Uh, so I was carrying on with that, but also doing sort of free jazz stuff as well. And the world of session work at that time, did that open up to you as well? Did you do many um, sessions? Yeah, a you? little bit, yes. I did a bit of uh, a few sessions. I know I'm on uh, the introduction to Sorrow by the Mercy Beats. Very proud of that. Really? The board bass intro. Yes. Oh, well, that's me. <laughs> I had no idea you're on that track. No, it's great. <laughs> uh, my boy Lollipop, I did. Uh, uh, gosh, a lot of funny things. The Scaffold. <laughs> it seemed to be. I did that. Uh, some stuff with Burt Bacharach, which was amazing. Um, Peter Sellers, yeah. Oh yes, After the Fox. Yeah, after the Fox. Yes. <laughs> I think they suppressed that movie. <laughs> Forgot about that one. Yeah. So, with with things changing at that at that point, you know, the with with Graham Bond, you you really did sort of push some boundaries even further. Then was that sort of. Uh, a musical thing that was dictated by yourself, would you say? Was that Graham? Or? Well, Graham's band. Yes. Oh, I think it was just the, the four people in it, really, of that particular band, which I think was the best band, the best organisation he ever had, I think. And, uh, yeah, it was just those four guys, the chemistry between them. I, I don't think it was much more than that. Because on, on the surface, you hope that the... the four disparate members of the band. Uh, it was very much like Graham's this. band, you know, yes. he really was, yeah. He, he came up with the material mostly and of course sung it. Uh, and I was, yeah, very happy to be a part of that that band. It was quite uh, quite an experience because often we were, we were traveling around, often opening clubs, you know, uh, that's, we would be the first act on, that was quite a good thing to be doing, sort of pioneering. Uh, the place in Hanley, for instance, which I, I don't know if that's still going, but, but it's, you, uh, that's a very famous club. You made some very pioneering music as part of part of the, oh, yeah. the Graham Bond organisation. I think a lot of people tend to overlook that. Uh, how yes, and uh, we were that. taking it around. The, you know, we played non-stop for uh, you know quite a while, a couple of years or whatever. So, when did you first start sort of getting into into uh, I know you've always written, but uh, when, when did you first sort of start getting into writing in terms of material for um, any, any of the bands you were actually in? Was that, was that, did that come with Cream or did um, The first thing I think uh, with, was with Graham, which is Hayseed County kicking Ho Ho Blues, that one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was the first thing that I wrote for a band, I believe, yeah. And then, of course, yeah, later with Cream. And after you, you were you then left the Graham Bond organisation. Yes, uh, I did. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> which is, has been mentioned elsewhere in many many other. Yeah. Things. Yes. So we won't go into. <laughs> you don't need to go into, uh, into that. And luckily, the knife didn't go into me. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, then you had a very stint with John Mayall. Um, yes. Then, um, yeah, I lived in the back of John Mayall's van for quite a while, a few months. Was that an excessive workload with, with him in terms of games? Uh, was it, a lot? it was quite, quite hard, yeah. And, and of course, touring was, uh, you know, you'd go from sort of Clan Dudno to Aberystwyth to Newcastle and then to Bournemouth. <laughs> 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 it's really ridiculous. The amount of driving that we did, because it was mostly pre-motorway days. Quite amazing. And so how did you, how did you adjust then to being in something uh, like like Manfred Mann, which was uh, perceived at that time, I suppose, like as, as a pop group, really, more than anything else? It was a pop group. I admit it. I hold, I hold my hands up. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I believe you're on pretty. Familiar, I have to be you? nice yeah. about that because Manfred claims that I never handed in my notice. Oh, really? And I still, <laughs> I still owe, in, owe him all this money for it. You know, back taxes or something. 
I see you were in Manfred Mann for a very short short space of time. Yeah, it wasn't, on, it on wasn't very long, but it was quite an experience to be in a to be in a pop group, uh, a beat group. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then the formation of Cream happened, which is, I would say, probably where your, your songwriting... Well, that was uh, the vehicle that I was fortunate enough to have, yeah. I don't think I'd have written a lot of those songs if it hadn't been for, for having that band to write for. And with Cream from the offset, really, it was such a, a, a diverse, uh, again, a, a wide stylistic di diversity within the band. That uh, was, Were there any restrictions on, on the sort of you came came up with songs was there was there any restriction to the sort of styles uh, that, that well, the band nothing ever with? was stated but if I came up with this song I would just sort of play it but that was a problem for me because I couldn't make demos or anything in those days that was just beyond my reach still uh, but so I would try and show them on the piano it's very difficult to show what something is like uh, Something like I feel free or something like that. How do you show somebody what that is? Um, so somehow I communicated those ideas. They're all written out, but unfortunately Eric doesn't, or for, you know, he doesn't read music. He hasn't held them back, hasn't done a lot of harm. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, on the other hand, read music very yeah. well. <laughs> you can read what you want into yes. that. <laughs> And of course, at Cream is where you, you started writing with, with, with Pete yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. How, how did, did you know Pete before? Oh, well, um, I'd vaguely uh, met him. He lived in a cupboard in Oppidens Road or somewhere like that, uh, which I think has been demolished a few times yeah. since then. Uh, so I would run into him, but then uh, we had this idea. Who had this idea? Uh, that we would go to my house and uh oh, my flat and we'd we'd have uh we'd write songs together that was right at the beginning and i got uh, i was supposed to write uh who's that? i was i was writing with ginger and uh oh no that wasn't right who was i supposed to be writing with but anyway i sort of inherited pete brown and uh we seem to have this kind of mad thing in common, uh, which has developed over the years, I think. I think the blueprints were there sort of from, from the start, you know, interesting music and, and interesting lyrics on a piece, even like your Cream's first single, such as Wrapping Paper, you know, it's, it's, mm. it was very different from what, what else was happening at the time. Yeah, I think, it know. was that. And then uh, your writing sort of progressed to the point, I, I, I imagine, on things like Wheels of Fire, where it became on certain things like Deserted Cities of the Heart, and I'm thinking of tracks like that, where you really did, um, I think, lead the way in terms of what what was possible in a recording studio to some extent. Uh, oh, well, there's no doubt about that, because uh, I don't think any really loud bands had recorded yet, and that was definitely us. So <laughs> I remember uh, Tom Dowd being pretty horrified when he saw our Mar Marshall Stacks but he very quickly adjusted to that, and then of course went on uh, to record Led Zeppelin and so on. So he must have, he, I think he learned on us. <laughs> <laughs> How to record a live band. Yeah. yeah, now he was uh, pr uh, pretty much a genius. He worked on the Manhattan Project before he became a, an engineer. Seriously? <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> really? yeah. I had no, how do you go from atomic bombs to music? I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess this is, yeah, you get explosions Think it's closer than you think. Yes. <laughs> You've got a snooker. <laughs> <laughs> and your, um, the, the live pace and, and the recording pace when you were in Cream must have been, been crazy because you, you look back at the amount of music you made in such a short space of time. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty nuts. You know, the amount of gigging, the you know, amount of touring we did. A lot of it not really um, what we should have been doing at the time, but that's... Uh, <laughs> That was what we were told to do, and we went and do. We were just, we were just like uh, children, I think, we, <laughs> and we were very exploited. But uh, yeah, in a way, it was amazing to be again like pioneering, I think, with that band, and going to all those sort of Midwest towns and playing every day. Uh, it was great, really. Yeah. 
And the band, that was when the band was very happy. And uh, that, that was a good time. And eventually when, when the, when there, for various reasons, you know, cream ran out of steam. Then, when it then, curdled. Yes. <laughs> Did you did you have have time then to take a, a step back and think what you were going to do as, as well? A I knew what I wanted to do while I was still with Cream. You know, I think we all, maybe not Ginger, but I think Eric and myself had uh, definite ideas of what we would, uh, wanted to do, and we, we couldn't do it within Cream anyway. Um, which was to have uh, more instruments, horns, if I wanted things like that. So, uh, yeah, I very much knew that. And then, of course, he uh, recorded songs through Taylor, uh, which brings us back to this record because it's, this is a version of it. <laughs> and, and, and on songs through Taylor, you used, again, the same sort of diversity of, of musicians playing on, on various Yeah, on various well, tracks. yeah, not quite as much as this, but, uh, yeah. So we had George Harrison and that, but we couldn't get him for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get the, the management of Snot out there anymore, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he used to be dead good. Yes. <laughs> I, I do have to ask you one question. It's something I've read in various... Um, in various it wasn't me. It was, well... It, <laughs> My rowing kit was just left there by accident. I've read a few accounts of the fact that you uh, uh, that you were possibly going to work with Jimi Hendrix. At oh time. yeah, no, that was that was yeah. a, a definite maybe that one. Yeah. Uh, well, Tony was just the greatest, and they should have played together. You know, I really felt that, and we ran into Jimi at uh, I think the Speakeasy, which was a club in London. Um, we ran into him and we were talking about it and we had arranged to uh, meet him but somehow we didn't meet him again but I think it may, we may well have played together at least, yeah. Because you, you mentioned Lifetime, I mean for me... The prospect of that is uh, quite something, you know, Jimmy. You, you know that song Hidden Cities, I think mm -hmm. it's a section of that and I, I really feel that that's what Jimmy would be doing now, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I can see that. Do you know the section I mean? Yes. I can definitely see that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you mentioned Lifetime. For me, one of the most underrated projects I think you've ever been involved with. Yeah, I just think it was uh, it was far out, man. So I, I think it was a bit too far out for for the folk at that time. I remember we played uh, the Newport Jazz Festival. We followed Buddy Rich, and the the place was packed. And then, as we went on, it started to rain. And we played the first chord of Dragon Song, which is one of McLaughlin's tunes. And it goes, crang, everybody left. Really? Immediately. They just vanished. <laughs> uh, it was a great band. Yeah, it was, that was a real, a real privilege to be able to play with those guys. Did, did, was there a reason why, Matt, uh, why that all sort of uh, ceased? At, or did it just run a, a um, course, Well, think? it was hard to... to uh, the first tour we did uh, really was over here, and uh, it was, the, audio, the the places were full of people expecting sort of cream, you know, and uh, we played this very outrageous music, uh, which uh, I think relates very much to cream, but uh, it's not cream. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and they noticed. Yeah. Unfortunately, they noticed. No, I, I think it was a lot of reasons. Uh, I think uh, John McLaughlin wanted to move on. I think he wanted to take that idea, sanitize it a bit, and get it out on the road, <laughs> which became my habitual orchestra. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And your, your solo career ever, ever since, I mean, have you... You've never attained the success that you've had. You had with with Cream, but that's obviously never been your um, initial. Yeah, that's never been your motivation. But does that ever uh, annoy you or, or bother you that your your albums like oh, Songs for a Table or Harmony Row haven't received that sort of attention? Right. Well, uh, I mean, it, it uh, actually Songs for a Taylor was quite a big hit, uh, and that was it really. 
But um, yeah, I would like it if more people were aware of what I'm, I'm doing. Of course I would. I wouldn't really want the, the superstardom thing. I haven't got the temperament for that. You know, no, it's not good. It's hard enough being me now. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, the more, you know, more people who, who are aware of what I've been doing, that obviously, like any artist, that's, to a certain extent, that's what you're doing it for. Uh, you know, more money, sure, send, send it. <laughs> Even small checks in the post are like that. <laughs> but, uh, over the over the past few years, I, th I think people have become in increasingly aware of your your legacy. Yes, as, I mean as it's a, amazing. At the moment, there's more and more people uh, who haven't heard uh, before heard, or thought I hadn't d done anything since Green. <laughs> a lot of people think that. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's a bit of a, a bit of an interest at the moment, which is it's good. But why not sooner? <laughs> you have to you have to deal with the cards you're given on you. That's a thing. Has has this album in, inspired you to carry on? Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I, I wanted to. Uh, I know exactly what the next one. I I've got a lot of it written already. So <laughs> watch out. <laughs> Won't end up living in Abbey Road. <laughs> got a good canteen there as well. <laughs> yes, talking to talking to the guys at Abbey Road, they thoroughly enjoyed having you there. Yeah, and, it was great. Uh, They're really good people down there. Yeah. Was that was that the first time you'd ever recorded there, or had you oh no, no, been... I recorded in the old days and more recently. Mm. But uh, yeah, the old days we did at Graham Bond that it sounded sixty five was recorded there, uh, and I worked did some other session stuff. Um, but it's nice, it's like a bit like working in a museum, in a nice way, you know what I mean? But everything works, that's the best thing about it. Because most studios, there's always something and it doesn't work. But they've got great people there, and uh, they've got the biggest collection of mics in the world. So, uh, you know, I, I was singing, doing, doing my vocals, it might have been the same uh, mic that Paul McCartney used. My goodness, think of that. <laughs> I hope they I hope they cleaned it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was lo looking back at the creation, going back to, to Silver Rails. It's been quite a sort of a family affair for you, really. Oh so, yeah, that, that's it? another great thing. That just uh, they just decided to take over my family. You know, they all because they all do things. Kyle has been uh, fil She's filmed it all. That will be coming out, and it's also uh, part of the deal that you can buy. Little making of things. She's been doing that. Natasha's been doing uh, every well. Aruba Red, I have to say, has been doing a lot, and she put together the uh, the singers on Hidden Cities. That was uh, she did that. Um, Margaret's been doing everything. Uh, my son, my younger younger son doesn't want me to talk about him, so uh, if you don't mind, I won't. Uh, Malcolm, of course, was invaluable uh, because he we did the demos here together. To, uh, for to you know to we did the demos, and uh, you know it was great working with him. We had a lot of fun. By the time you've done the demos, you think, well, this is it. It's, You've done it now. <laughs> so, did you actually record all the tracks, sort of, in their own yeah. right ahead of time? Yeah. Yes. You have to do that nowadays, really. And and how finished were the demos? Were they were they pretty um, close to what actually came out at the end at the end of the? Yeah, but obviously it's just me and Malcolm playing. Uh, mostly, there's not there's you know there's nobody else playing. But you could easily have used those tracks if you'd wanted to. But. Uh, it was nice to you take it to another level if you go into Abbey Road, obviously, uh, and having Rob, mm. fantastic. And uh, in in terms of future plans with uh, other 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 projects, have you anything else that you're 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 working on? At that uh, well, I would like to do this tour and then take uh, the summer off and write what is going on in my head now. Uh, that's what I'd like to do in an ideal world. <laughs> so, uh, 
So that's that's what we're, what we're aiming for. Might it might work out. And it's something which is, has been mentioned, I've, I've read in various things, um, in fact it, it, it's been mentioned uh, many times actually since the advent of a certain f uh, film that came out about uh, oh, a yeah. certain drummer yeah. uh, <laughs> that you who shall be named with, you, you, you work, you've worked with in the, in the past. <laughs> um, do you ever see oh, yourself ever, Mr. Baker. ever working with Mr. Baker again or anything <laughs> at all? Not if he's got his cane. No. No. <laughs> Um, well, he's he's a lovely drummer. He's a great drummer, of course. If mm. if he wants to play, I, I would never say no. Uh, I don't think would I? I don't know. <laughs> Can't give you an answer on that one. How do you feel about the the way that you were represented in that film? I mean, does that? I don't know. I haven't seen the film. Seen I, I okay. won't see the film. But I have seen the the crucial uh, denouement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which is when he bashes yeah. him on the nose on the on the hooter. I mean that was terrible. Now when he came here, the director came here after I'd said I didn't want to do it. He just showed up at the house and he said, "You got to see this." And he showed me, he showed me that scene. <laughs> I better do this. This poor guy. I must do this <laughs> interview. Because he had his nose broken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he, he lived with him for months. Yeah. I mean that enough. That is uh, more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't, yeah. So so the chances of you, working I, you know, I. Uh, let me just say first yes. of all, I think Ginger's nuts, <laughs> 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 and uh, I wish him well. Mm. <laughs> That's all I can say. Yes. About that. <laughs> so th tell me something about your new band that you've got, the or the eight-piece band you have. Um, yeah, well, not, we're not new. We've been around for a while, a few years. Uh, they're really good. What else would you like to know? What, how, how, what's, what comprises the band? I mean, uh, well, three one. horns, uh, Paddy on keyboards, <laughs> uh, terrible with names, uh, Frankie Tonto on drums, Tony Remy on guitar, myself on piano and bass, uh, Paddy Milner, on keyboards, uh, Nick Cohen on bass, and the three horn players. So it must make a pretty tremendous sound on stage with all these right. guys. Yeah. Damn right. So the idea of, of playing with the horn section as well must be... Uh, must be yeah, well it just opens it up, it's nice. You know, sometimes I, I'll do something just with, uh, uh, you know, trio, so it's, you know, we balance it up. Did the horn section play on, on the album? Uh, almost. I mean, with horn, horn sections, there's always one floating around. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, they are the same guy, apart from the trumpet player, who, couldn't, who had a, an accident on the way to the studio. <laughs> uh, Winston Rollins is the, uh, the, that's what they call the Winston Rollins horns. A few years ago, I saw you at Ronnie Scott's. I think was it was that the band that actually played at, at uh, more Scott's or less. Now? Yeah, have you? Uh, I stole them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you enjoy playing those kind of venues like like Ronnie Scott's? Is, is, is are the the more intimate venues the ones that appeal to you? That's very intimate, at Ronnie's. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I like playing at Ronnie's. It's, it's it's a nice experience. And have you any plans to uh, play further afield? Um, in, in support of the album? Uh, well, we're sort of uh, thinking about that at the moment. Um, certainly Germany has come up, and that's, uh, that's good. It's, you know, it's a good place to tour, so I could maybe do something there. Do you see yourself going back to America um, soon? Um, I haven't really thought about that, but it's always possible. <laughs> Uh, recently, you gave a lecture in in New New York, or you well, that, that's which, which is, I would put it in those terms. But I did do something there. Yeah, I just became a stand up for. A <laughs> <laughs> how did how did you get involved? How did that come about? Because they just a, contacted me this uh, foundation, and I thought I'm not doing that. That's bound to be something to do with the CIA. That's always my <laughs> first reaction. And then I just sort of googled it and see, uh, saw the sort of people who had done it before, which is what they do, which is why they do it. Because, so I, uh, when I saw that uh, 
People like Ken Loach and uh, I thought it must be all right. You know, Kez, go on. Yeah, so, so <laughs> you joined a long list of very interesting people. Yeah, so it was, it, it was fun to do, yeah. And for you, uh, in, in terms of um, the w where you are now with, with making music at this, this time in your life, does that actually, and, and considering you know, you've had uh, some health issues and, and, and all the rest of it in the past, does that influence your, your how much does that influence your writing um, these days? I don't think it does. <laughs> I think that uh, comes from another place when you're writing, so you're not, you don't re you're not really involving your body or anything like that. This is coming straight from God. <laughs> So the inspiration is, is still there? It seems to be. I didn't know it was still there because I hadn't looked for it for a while. Um, my head is always full of things like hidden cities and like going around, which is why uh, I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> Do you continually write? Do you, you yeah, it's not something you, you choose, you, not something you can't do, because I write in my head. So <laughs> unless I have some way of unscrewing it, I'm in trouble. <laughs> So you're always thinking of music, consider, yeah, pretty much, all the time, yeah. And and sort of thinking of things and then forgetting them, and spending days trying to get them back. Do you actually write write uh, yeah, music? Yeah, very out? often. Do you I'll, do that? Very often, I just write. I've got a little notebook. I write things down. Uh, if I'm here, I've got a very quick, easy way of uh, of recording at the piano. Um, and that, that, there's that great story of uh, Earl Garner who wrote uh, uh, that song, uh, Misty. Da, da, da. That's the beginning notes. And he can write music. And he was on a plane. So the stewardess would come up and say, Coffee, tea. And he'd go, Da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> you had to remember that. No plane flight. I you know, he was a poor man again. <laughs> About just over 10 years ago, you um, released an album which had a, a distinctly sort of Cuban feel uh, to it. Uh, and then from there, you've been involved with uh, going to Cuba and uh, working with, with uh, musicians there. Uh, can you explain how that all came about initially? Right, well, I've always uh, uh, liked <clears throat> the, the Cuban influence, really. The first time I had uh, something like that was uh, was, was uh, the Dizzy Gillespie Big Band with Chano Pozo on on on, uh, on drums, and I've always liked that. And then I, many years ago, I got a, a cassette showed up in the post, and it was Kip Hanrahan who had sent this uh, this bunch of uh, unfinished songs and said, "Would you like to come and?" just singing on top of this and <laughs> the stuff was so beautiful I couldn't believe it and that started a, a long relationship which still carries on uh, and uh, then I stole his band for a while <laughs> um, and uh, that, that was the Cuicaland Express which uh, was great, a great experience to play with those guys I loved that yeah and then of course uh, I went, uh, two years ago, I went to Cuba with Phil Manzanera uh, at the sort of government, uh, state-sponsored thing. <laughs> so it was, it was quite, uh, quite an experience uh, to see how the socialist state works there. <laughs> that was, that was very, uh, very uh, informative. Um, and yeah, so that's also how Phil is on this record because uh, we met up there where we did that thing together, uh, and there he is. So, what was it like playing playing in Havana to to go there? Um, it was uh, quite strange, really, because it's all very organised in in a political sense. There's the the band leader, and whatever he says goes, and you know. So he was he was uh, doing he was we were doing something of mine, and he was completely doing it wrong. But when I told him that, uh, he just sort of said, "Well, that's the way we do it here," or something like that. 
I said, yeah, fair enough. But can we do it like this, the way I do it? <laughs> and he wouldn't do it right up until the last minute. And then he said, oh, all right, we do it. <laughs> so it's like, it was that like that. And I took a set of strings and gave them to the, the bass player. And he was, he was over the moon because you can't even get strings. Really? Yeah. So were people in Cuba um, aware of, of your music? Or, or yes, there's a, there's a hardcore there. There's a, uh, a guy called Juanito who <laughs> has a radio program. And he's, he's always playing my stuff. Again, he's, been in, he's had trouble with the authorities as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's very, people are wonderful. Uh, but the regime is no doubt it's uh, as it has to be in order to survive. It's very strict, although it's kind of light lightening up a bit now. But still pretty strict. <laughs>